For a large global company like Shell, making their own scenarios for the future of energy has been an important tool in helping their leaders explore ways forward and make better decisions. This is something that the company has done for 50 years now, and we're soon going to get an insight in why and how these scenarios matter from one of Shell's top analysts. Peter Wood is Shell's chief energy advisor, and he's here today to tell us how they see innovation within and beyond technology on the path to net zero 2050. Peter will, like the other speakers, participate in the discussion later on, so pop questions for him in Slido. The code is still 2022 ETC. But first, a warm welcome to Peter Wood from Shell. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, as discussed, I'm going to speak a little bit about our scenarios, which we use to think about the future. We're not trying to predict the future. We're trying to come up with a sort of a range of outcomes. Touch on efficiency, touch on scale, something that's extremely important, and then a few potential actions at the end. They're tremendously well organized. Anybody who's ever done this job, you want a button that's two buttons, forwards and backwards, so it's great. Um, shell scenarios. So um, we came out with these scenarios last year, um, which has proven, sadly, to be between one crisis and another. We had COVID, and now we've got a war. And in the middle of all of this, we've got an ongoing climate crisis. Slower burning, but just as serious. So if you think about 2020 and COVID, that was a one in 100 year event. Perhaps not for the energy system, but for the world at large. And that was a huge shock. I remember getting up one morning when I was living in Houston in April that year, and I looked out the window Tuesday afternoon, and the roads were dead. It was like Christmas Day. And we were monitoring through our trading activities what was happening to the world, and oil demand had gone from 100 million barrels a day down to 80 million barrels a day. On the one hand, a tremendous drop, something that you really have never seen before. On the other hand, the world was still using 80 million barrels of oil a day. And the thing that, that's sort of been fascinating watching the energy system coming out of that is, even though it's had this tremendous shock, it's largely reverted to mean. It's largely gone back to where it was. So when we sat down to think about these scenarios, we said, well, there's kind of three lenses we want to look at. We want to look at wealth, security, and health. Now, health will be a net zero trajectory. This is what we all want to happen. We want to force down carbon emissions from today. And if you do that in a very normative fashion, Perhaps you can reach a 1.5 world, i.e. temperatures don't go up more than 1.5, recognizing there's a large error bar around that. However, at the beginning of this year, I felt we were more in a waves world. A lot of cheap money had been pumped into the economy. Energy demand was rebounding very strongly. Oil demand was back to where it was. And actually, the world was set and may still use as much oil, gas, and coal this year as it's ever done. Now, of course, renewables are growing as well. And every year, we use as much as the world has ever done because it's growing so much, but it's still at a relatively full fraction. So that's where I was at the beginning of the year. Unfortunately, with what's happening in Ukraine, we're seeing a pivot. Energy security. I heard my colleague from, uh, uh, from the European Union there. Overnight, we've reprioritized on energy security. And that takes you to a world where, when you put security first, your economic growth might not be quite as fast. You're not so excited about the efficiency that comes with a globalized world, you're much more interested in the security of doing things at home. And in that world, you're potentially talking about a later transition and potentially a slower transition, which leads to a higher temperature. So that's a bit of a feeling. If you're interested in more on that, go and have a look at our website. That's the only pitch I'll make. Um, moving forward now, efficiency. I think efficiency is sort of a, 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 bit of a, a bit of a poor stepchild, if you like, of the energy system, even though it's so important. So what you see over the last half century or so, we have at least halved the energy to do key activities, produce steel, travel in your car, keep your fridge warm, keep the lights on. And if we look in our, in our modeling, without any huge innovations, you're likely to see that continuous trend. And over the next half century, you're going to at least halve again. And where you get a true breakthrough, electric vehicles, considerably more efficient than internal combustion engine, light emitting diodes, which I think we've probably got here, you can get much more of a jump. In lighting, it's an order of magnitude. So that's great, we'll bank that, but that's still not enough. If we move now to the challenge of scaling. Now, 
When you go to presentation school, they tell you not to use log scale charts in large rooms of people. But this is a technical university, so I'm going to give it a go. Um, exajoules, let's start with the units. Um, one exajoule, we use that because we're trying to be sort of fuel agnostic. It's about half a million barrels of oil a day, one exajoule per year, if that's your unit. It's about 30 gigawatts of power generation on a fully loaded basis, or very roughly, there's somebody in the back who probably knows these numbers better, but I think it's very roughly the amount of energy to run Norway in a year. It's about a one exajoule economy. Now, globally, um, on a primary energy basis, I think we're at about 600 exajoules. That's the scale of the enterprise that we're dealing with today. And by 2050, it could be 50% bigger. By 2100, it's probably going to be twice as big. Of course, the population will be bigger, but people are going to get richer. So I've taken a select group of energies here, and a couple of points I want to make. You see these lines coming up and the jumps and the bumps and so on and so forth. Materiality is between 1 and 10 exajoules, very roughly. So in oil language, half a million and five million barrels a day of oil. That's when something's starting to get interesting. And if you look, these energy technologies here, we've got CCS, that's a generator of energy decarbonization, but these things are taking two to three decades to go from small laboratory test scale through to something that's starting to have a material impact. And then you maybe need another two or three decades to get to the point where it's becoming dominant. So if you look at the technologies that we're going to be relying on, so wind and solar, they're in the materiality range now, but they need to increase over the next two decades by two orders of magnitude, so 100 times. Now, the oil industry ain't going to increase by 100 times, but wind and solar are. If you look at CCS biofuels, hydrogen, in our models, potentially three orders of magnitude. Now, is it three orders or two and a half? It doesn't really matter tremendous growth in these technologies to bring enough raw energy so then we can go down the path of hydrogen and decarbonization of this and that. So that's the scaling challenge. What other challenges have we got? Well, we've got to build all this infrastructure. So people sort of in the oil industry anyway tend to focus often on the capital on the supply side of the equation. But there's probably about 10 times as much capital on the demand side of the equation. So if you think about it, the capital to produce the oil to go into your car, but then you've got 1.4 billion cars around the world, I don't know, average price, $20,000. That's a lot of capital, and that's just the cars. So we've got that. Then as we move across, we've got to work with industry and the hard to abate. You saw the previous speaker on steel. It's no good as an energy company sort of rocking up, here's my hydrogen, what about it? No, you've got to work in collaboration because there their process, maybe their energy system, has got to change within their company. Then we've got to work with governments. So Shell is building a, um, a large sustainable aviation fuel plant in Rotterdam. The product that comes out of it, we're very proud of it, but the fact is it's three times as expensive as the fossil equivalent. So if customers are going to buy that, they've got to have a reason, and that's largely coming from government. And then the final is, is energy security and, and keeping everybody on board. So, it's shocking, really, when you check the numbers, but two, sorry, one third of the world's population is still cooking their lunch on traditional biofuels. And one tenth of the world's population doesn't yet have access to electricity in any reliable form. So we, of course, don't feel that here, but there's a lot of work to be done, not only on all of these things, but also the others. Thank you.